Okay, everybody, welcome to chapter three. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to talk about some of the uh, different aspects that underlie cell differentiation. So I want to start out by uh, reminding you, or if you haven't uh, have a lot of genetic background, uh, giving you kind of a primer on the central dogma of biology. And that is that DNA uh, up here is transcribed, so it's made into RNA, so first it's nuclear RNA, then there is processing where the uh, introns are spliced out to make a fully functional uh, finalized RNA that has a poly A tail on one side and a five prime cap on the other side. And then that mRNA is transported out of the nucleus where it goes to the ribosome and that ribosome reads that mRNA and translates it, so the process of translation, into a functional protein. So the mRNA is really just the blueprint for the protein. And at that point, proteins in this case are what have final function. They are actually the components that carry out some sort of activity within the cell. Um, there are exceptions to every rule. Um, in this case, we're learning a lot more about microRNAs and some of these functional RNAs that, that play roles without becoming a protein first. Um, for the cases of this lecture, um, we're going to assume that proteins are what carry out the finalized function of a gene. And so these uh, proteins are some of the aspects that lead, or some of the underlying factors that lead to cell differentiation. So one of the core aspects of DNA is that it is this bundle of information of all the genes in your genome, and it remains there throughout the life of the cell. So it's not irreversibly changed. So when a cell differentiates, the DNA stays the same. And uh, this can be tested through uh, cloning experiments. So for instance, um, if this is probably before most of you were born, but there was an experiment in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, where they cloned a sheep. And so if DNA underwent irreversible change whenever a cell differentiated, and that DNA was only specific, for example, in uh, uh, melanocytes, then if you took a melanocyte and you tried to make it into a different type of um, of tissue, then it wouldn't work, right? Because that DNA was irreversibly made into melanocyte DNA. However, through these cloning experiments, what we can see is if you remove a cell uh, from a sheep that is, for example, an udder cell uh, here, we can take that genetic material from the udder of a sheep place that genetic material in an egg, which contains all the transcription factors and morphological agents that are responsible for development. And we can see that through culturing, we can create an entire new sheep. So even though this DNA was removed from the udders of a sheep, so it was removed from a specialized tissue, you still have the full complement of DNA for the entire genome that is able to be cultured specifically to make an entire new sheep. So even though cells undergo differentiation and become very specialized, they still contain the entire complement of genes for every type of cell tissue within the organism. So as I mentioned in the last slide, um, a very uh, classic case of this or a classic example was the cloning of Dolly the sheep, which was the first uh, higher mammalian uh, animal that was cloned successfully, uh, and uh, I believe she went on to have her own offspring as well. And so um, this idea that um, re regardless of where you get DNA from, you still have the full complement of genes necessary to uh, create an entire organism is, is important to remember. So if every cell contains the entire complement of DNA, how do we get specification and how do we only use those genes that are required for creating udder tissue or heart tissue etc and so the way this is done it's modulated through access to the dna so genes that are specific for 
uh, the formation of heart tissue or muscle tissue or whatever specialized tissue you're going to do, those genes are prevented from being accessed in incorrect tissue. So uh, in brain tissue, genes that encode for proteins um, and responsible for the development of heart tissue, those genes are uh, turned off, so to speak. They are prevented access from the transcription machinery, and so they don't get utilized. Um, and this is done through um, uh, epigenetic modification is, is one of these key aspects. And here we have a picture of a nucleosome. A nucleosome is a bundle of DNA made up of histone proteins. And so what it does is it kind of wraps tight the DNA of genes that are not required for the development of a specialized tissue. And so you can prevent those genes from being erroneously uh, transcribed and turned into proteins by preventing access to that um, replication or that uh, transcription machinery. In addition to histone modification, there are a couple other epigenetic um, modifications or factors that also prevent or grant access to genes specific for tissue development or differentiation. Uh, these are uh, methylation, which is the adding of a methyl group to a gene. This puts a methyl group on a, uh, GCs, uh, um, within the gene and it acts as a bit of a roadblock for that transcription machinery that's trying to come through and turn that gene into RNA. Uh, there's also acetylation. Uh, acetylation is uh, a modification to histones that allow for the histones to move out of the way if that gene needs to be accessed for differentiation. And uh, histone modifications, both methylation and acetylation, act on those histones to grant access to genes. So these are three of uh, the known mechanisms for allowing access to the genes required for differentiation or preventing access to genes that are not required uh, for that specific cell type. So we, here we have a uh, depiction of uh, this, these nucleosomes. So a nucleosome is these histone proteins that are wrapped with DNA. So that one unit here, um, let me circle it, that depicts a nucleosome. So nucleosomes wrap around histones. So these green things here, these are histones. Um, and then this big package altogether would represent chromatin. So it's kind of a, a step process or, or compartmentalized process where you have nucleosomes um, which are wrapped up histones, and then a bunch of nucleosomes together make chromatin. And this is, as you can see, so this DNA is gray here, uh, that's what's represented. And this DNA, if you're a uh, transcription factor or something trying to make this DNA and read it and turn it into mRNA, you can see that getting access to this DNA to transcribe those genes is very difficult because it's wrapped up and the access is really restricted based on the packaging of it. And so this is a way you would assume that in this case, all these genes that are wrapped around these histones are not accessible and are turned off in the development of this specific cell. So once again, I kind of buried the lead in the last slide, um, but here is a better depiction of what I was talking about. So um, histones uh, are these individual proteins and they form these octamer bundles. So there's eight histones that make up kind of one histone complex. And those histones wrap up DNA. And when they do, we call that a nucleosome. So a wrapped up piece of DNA with histones is a nucleosome. When we get a whole bundle of nucleosomes together to prevent access, we get chromatin. Chromatin is just a large bundle of these nucleosomes together. Now, as you can kind of see here, this DNA that is wrapped up, it is not accessible for transcription. However, if you were to move this, uh, these nucleosomes and kind of slide them out, you can grant access to specific pieces of DNA where genes reside and allow for transcription for those genes, which would lead to differentiation. So say for instance, right here in this little exposed section, we have genes for muscle development. 
So those nucleosomes, if that tissue was um, destined to become muscle tissue, those nucleosomes would slide away and allow access to those genes. While maybe in this section over here, this is where brain tissue uh, proteins are. And because this uh, differentiating tissue is not specified to become a brain, those are wrapped up to prevent access because we don't need those proteins. It'd be a waste of energy for us to make those proteins and it might make some sort of weird chimeric cell that we don't want. So only access to the cell or to the genes responsible for the development that we want, that the, the, speci the undifferentiated cells are specified for, are granted access. So how do these nucleosomes slide and how do they know when to slide? So the mechanism that allows them to slide is, as we talked about in that epigenetic slide a few slides back, is methylation and acetylation. So methylation causes these histones to be kind of tightly bound and prevent them from moving. So here we have these red dots and these red dots represent methyl groups that were added to the tails of the histones. So they're specifically modifying those proteins that are wrapping up the DNA. Now, if we want to gain access to a gene, specifically a gene required for uh, differentiation, we'll go with muscle tissue again. So we want to get to genes that transcribe from muscle tissue. Then the histones that are uh, wrapping up those genes and preventing access are instead acetylated. And so the methyl groups are removed and uh, acetyl groups are added. And that allows this flexibility in these histones and it allows that DNA to slide and those histones to slide and kind of become loosely packaged so you can gain access to this DNA. And so for instance here we might have our muscle gene um, that we're trying to transcribe. So once these histones are acetylated they can slide out and this gene can be transcribed, mRNA is made, and then it goes and it becomes some globular protein that has a function within the cell. So on these histone tails, there are conserved lysine amino acids. And these lysines are where the epigenetic modifications of acetylation or methylation occur. And so here we have residues 4, 38, and 79, and they're associated with gene activation. So methylation at those sites will result in activation of the gene. And at sites 9 and 27, these are representative of uh, silencing or repressing the gene. So we're not going to get too much into uh, the actual minutia of um, which each of these do, but just know that there are five locations within these histone tails that these modifications occur. Um, So let's look a little more closely at a gene, what it contains, and mRNA, what that contains in this process of transcription and translation. So upstream of a gene, we have this promoter region, and that is the region where RNA polymerase, the, the transcription machinery that actually turns a gene into mRNA, that's where it kind of starts off at. And we have a transcription initiation site, so this is the very first site of turning DNA into mRNA, so the first uh, copy of uh, a nucle uh, nucleotide is made at this point. Um, a little further downstream, we have the initiation codon. So this is the first codon that is read by the ribosome and incorporated as an amino acid in the protein. Uh, the yellow here indicates exons, so these are the parts that actually encode for protein. It also includes introns. These are regions that break up exons or in between exons. They do not code for any protein themselves. Um, at the end, we have a poly A site. So this mRNA is turned into or is added in, uh, with a poly A tail. So it's a bunch of uh, A's at the end of the sequence um, and then a termination site. So once this is transcribed, we have nuclear RNA. And as you can see here, the promoter is absent. So the promoter is never turned into RNA. We have our transcription initiation site and then our first 
uh, codon, so the first amino acid that is going to be incorporated, and we still have introns present here. So during the processing stage, the introns are spliced out because they don't encode for any sort of amino acid in the protein. And so there's this AGGU rule that note that uh, the spliceosome, the part that uh, takes out introns, that it'll read and it says, okay, these are introns, we're gonna take them out. And so once that has happened, we have a mRNA, a mature mRNA, that has a cap. This five prime cap helps uh, locate the mRNA to the ribosome and kind of set it up to be turned into a protein. We have our yellow introns here. We have our first uh, codon, which is AUG. We have the rest of our codons that make up the protein. And then we have a poly A tail. The poly A tail also uh, it protects the mRNA and it also um, is used for kind of guiding uh, the mRNA, but we're not gonna get too much into that. Um, then the process of translation, which happens at the ribosome, we have uh, this ribosome will read that mRNA and will read those codons, so three base pairs at a time, and incorporate the proper amino acid to this growing chain of uh, amino acids. Once that happens, we have uh, these uh, this post-translation modification, so we allow folding of this chain of amino acids, and that gives us our final form of this protein. So it'll make a globular, as they say, so a 3D structure of this protein from the amino acid chain. So that's just kind of a, a reminder or a primer on the steps of translation, uh, transcription and translation. Let's talk a little bit about the actual uh, mechanism of transcription. And so transcription factors are proteins that actually carry out the process of reading DNA and turning it into mRNA. So we know about polymerase, which actually does the physical job itself, but these other trans transcription factors play a role and are required for transcription of a gene. So we have our uh, polymerase, which binds to the promoter, and it is not able to transcribe, in this case, unless it links up with some of these other transcription factors. Um, these other transcription factors bind to a region called the enhancer. The enhancer is a region upstream of the promoter, uh, and this is a region uh, is, uh, that is required for activation of this gene. So these transcription factors will be bound, and uh, for example, with this uh, LDV1, and that helps recruit and bends the DNA so the enhancer comes into contact or close proximity to the promoter. At that point, this other transcription factor, GATA1, is able to bind to both the enhancer and the promoter region, and this LBD1 uh, kind of links the two, and it makes this uh, transcription complex, so to speak. And this complex then, once GATA1 has bound to this complex, is able to fully transcribe the gene. So these are very important in uh, creating mRNA from DNA. So how do these transcription factors access the genes um, when they're bound up in nucleosomes? So these nucleosomes at this point are um, acetylated, so they're relatively open uh, compared to the tightly bound chromatin that we've seen in previous slides. These enzymes then uh, push their way, so these are the transcription factors, uh, push their way into the DNA in between the nucleosomes, and they utilize these nucleosome modifying enzymes, uh, which help to further push and remove the nucleosomes from this area. So this includes uh, the promoter and enhancer area that is required uh, for, ac or access is required for, for proper transcription. So once the access has been kind of granted, um, these two enzymes up here, these are the enzymes that help to push the histones out of the way to grant access to the genes that we're looking at. Those leave because their only role was to help grant access for those transcription factors to the enhancer. And then a, a complex called the mediator complex. This is actually a protein uh, complex that uh, Dr. Jamie Newman works on here at, at Louisiana Tech, 
um, this mediator complex comes in and binds to the enhancers, the transcription factors on those enhancers, and helps to set everything up. As mediator uh, helps set things up by recruiting these other transcription factors, such as RNA polymerase, uh, which is required for the creation of RNA. Uh, so as the name suggests, it kind of mediates uh, these transcription factors coming to the proper place and lining up for transcription. And so in addition, uh, we have some other transcription factors, um, uh, TAF2A and 2B, which are generalized transcription factors. Uh, they are recruited, uh, recruited to the uh, promoter region to start transcription. And then in addition, another protein comes in called cohesion, which kind of stabilizes the entire uh, uh, pre-initiation complex, as we call it. And so uh, at this point, we have everything in place that will allow for transcription of a gene that was previously uh, bound up in nucleosomes and access was not granted. So once this complex is formed, it's important that we're able to kind of modulate and and rein in how much transcription is happening because we don't want to turn on a gene and never be able to turn it off and we want to make sure that we're making only amount of the only the desired amount of uh, RNA and not more or less and so um, once this complex is formed there are really two different outcomes that can happen on the right here we have elongation and this is what you would expect where the uh, transcription elongation complex TEC here comes in and it binds to the uh, complex and the RNA and it allows transcription to happen in the creation of this mRNA. Now on the other hand we could have uh, NELF come in which is a repressive transcription factor and that helps to stop uh, or at least pause transcription from occurring and it does this by preventing TEC from binding to this complex up here. And so it's important to also know that this NELF, its binding is reversible. So it's kind of a pause button, so to speak, as when NELF comes in, it stops the machinery from continuing on. However, it can be removed if we need to increase transcription uh, at a later time. Adding even more specificity to this uh, transcription uh, activity, different tissues have different enhancer regions. And so we can ensure that specifically this gene is transcribed only in the tissue that it needs to be transcribed in. So in this example here, we have gene A over on the right-hand side. And gene A uh, is a protein that is expressed in only brain and limb tissue. So there are two tissue-specific enhancers where we have a brain one indicated here in blue and a limb specific one indicated here in gray or in green I apologize uh, and so these enhancers are acted upon only in the specific tissue that they need to be expressed in and now as you can see here in the brain tissue we'll have transcription factors that are specific to the development of brain or specialization of brain tissue and those transcription factors will bind only to the brain specific enhancer. So they are specific only for one enhancer and not the other. And so at this point, mediator comes in and that initiation complex, pre-initiation complex for transcription is set up and we get transcription of the gene. Now, uh, we're not gonna get into it fully here, but this also can be coupled with alternative splicing where each of these different uh, exons here are incorporated in different amounts. So for example, uh, if the brain specific uh, protein is slightly different than the limb specific protein, we might only include these first three uh, exons. And then in the limb specific tissue, we might include the last three. And so this gives us a way of really specializing what proteins are in which cells uh, and help to kind of really differentiate the number of different proteins that are incorporated. And so if you look at the human genome, there's 26,000 plus genes in the human genome, but there are over 
a hundred thousand different proteins and so there has to be a way that one gene can encode for more than one protein and this is a way that we can uh, create different proteins more proteins than there are genes and make sure that they're in the specific tissue that they need to be now here is the counterexample to the brain specific uh, enhancer so in the developing limb tissue we'll have transcription factors that are specific only for uh, expression within the limb so those transcription factors will bind to the limb specific enhancer recruit the mediator complex which recruits the transcription machinery and then we have transcription of this protein only in the limb tissue as you can see from this example a one specific gene can have multiple enhancer regions that are uh, cell type specific and it's also important to note that these enhancers can be in different regions of the gene so they don't have to all be upstream of the promoter in this example here we have a retina enhancer so eye development where the enhancer is in between the fourth and fifth exon of that gene so the enhancers really um, can be in various different places in, uh, regard, in regards to where the gene lies within the genome um, and contrary to our previous example uh, each gene can have more than two enhancers and have quite a few different enhancers that are cell type specific. So let's add a little bit more complexity, another layer of complexity to this enhancer region uh, talk. So in addition to cell type specific, some cell types will require more than one enhancer be present for that gene to be transcribed. So in this example, we have genes that are present in the lens development of the eye. And we see here that we PAX6, SOX2, and LMAF are all required to be bound by the proper transcription factors for this gene to be transcribed. So this is an added level of control where we need multiple con uh, transcription factors present for this to develop. And as you'll see in later chapters, these gradients will play a role on if those transcription factors are present or not. So we can get very specific to which cells in this developing organism are able to transcribe that gene. Because we don't want lens tissue to develop in the middle of your forehead or something like that. So we really, really need to control this tightly. But these uh, transcription factors that bind to enhancers, they play multiple roles. So as we see here, we have PAC6 which is required for transcription of the eye gene. They're the genes within the eye, the lens, but PAC6 also needs to be present in the pancreas. Um, it has to be bound to one of the many enhancers for pancreas genes to be transcribed. So depending on if you're a cell that has PAC6 and SOX2 and LMAF, then you know, okay, I need to become lens tissue. And if you're a cell that has PAC6 uh, along with CREB, PDX1, uh, those three enhancers, uh, then you know that you need to be pancreas tissue. So this adds another aspect of how we can really finely tune which cells will become what type of tissue. So we've talked about how we can turn on gene expression and we talked a little bit about how we can turn off gene expression with um, uh, restricting access with epigenetic modification, but there's also other regulatory elements because remember, if you look at an organism such as a human, look at all the different tissues that you can just visibly see with you know, your fingernails and your fingers and your hands and your hair and your eyes and everything, all so different. So we really need all these different mechanisms to control which cells will become which tissue. So silencers are these regulatory regions that lie uh, generally upstream of a gene, and or sorry, downstream of a gene. And in these regions, um, repressor proteins will bind and it will prevent this protein from transcribing that gene. So if genetics, you may have gone over uh, the LAC operon. Uh, the LAC operon has uh, these um, operators, which are regions that uh, that repressors will bind and so silencers are similar to that in that they repress the transcription of a particular gene by allowing this binding of a big protein here and so when the RNA polymerase tries to transcribe down that path there's something in the way and it doesn't allow it to happen.
So in this example here, we see that this is a neural gene, and you can see this dark stain here is staining the presence of that gene. Uh, and so in areas where we have this orange or cream color, that gene is not present, and so or that protein product from that gene. So if we were to remove that sequence, that repressor protein or that silencer doesn't have anywhere to bind. And if that's the case, as in the example on the bottom here in B, we can see that expression of this gene happens throughout the organism and not just in the regulated regions that we want it to occur in. And so these silencers are important for restricting expression of this gene in areas such as this cream colored area on the top here that we don't want expression of that gene to occur in. So as we talked before, methylation can affect uh, the nucleosomes and the chromatin um, by methylating those histone tails to allow or prevent sliding of those histones. But methylation can also occur directly on a gene and affect expression that way. So in this case here, we have the gamma globin gene, which is purple here, and we have the epsilon globin gene, which is in green here. And as you can see, in the first instance, at six weeks old of human development, we have methylation of this promoter for the gamma globin gene. And so that prevents transcription of this gene and only allows for the other globin gene, uh, the epsilon globin gene, to be transcribed. Now, after 12 weeks, um, we see that this is flipped. And instead, we have methylation of the promoter for the uh, e-globin gene, for the epsilon globin gene. And we remove those methyl groups from the promoter of the uh, gamma globin gene and allow the expression of gamma globin to happen. And so this is part of development where early on in development, the uh, globin gene requirement, uh, the epsilon globin gene is required. And later on in development, the uh, epsilon, or sorry, the uh, gamma globin gene is then required. Um, and so we can differentiate which genes are expressed at what time based on this methylation. So turning genes on and off, this epigenetic modification uh, occurs through methylation of the promoter site. So when this methylation happens, it should be noted, um, these are like physical barriers from allowing that transcription machinery, that RNA polymerase that we talked about previously, from being able to access that promoter and then interact with mediator and, and start this uh, transcription activity. In addition to acting on the promoters, these methyl groups can also block access to the enhancer regions. So remember, the enhancer region is required for uh, this uh, interaction between the promoter and the transcription machinery and the enhancer group. Well, in genes that require an enhancer, if there is a methyl group that is added to that enhancer binding region, then that enhancer is not allowed access to that region, and it will prevent the proper relationship being formed between the transcription machinery and the enhancer, and thus the gene is inactive. Now, if there are no methyl groups, like in the top example here, that enhancer element, transcription factor, is able to bind to its proper site, interact with the promoter region and the transcription machinery as it's lined up, and we get active gene uh, transcription. So what is the mechanism for adding and removing uh, these uh, epigenetic markers, uh, acetyl groups or methyl groups from histone tails. So there's this enzyme called MECP2, and what it does is it recognizes this methylated cytosine that is upstream of the nucleosome. And what it does when a methyl group needs to be added or and the acetyl group removed, uh, what it will do is it'll bind to that methylated cytosine and it will recruit histone uh, deacetylase, which is this green enzyme here, and it will take that acetyl group off of the histone tail. And so this will prevent that sliding because acetylation allows for more sliding of those nucleosomes while methylation provides more 
uh, it keeps it in place. And so to further solidify or prevent that nucleosome from sliding and prevent access to the gene, this MECP2 will then recruit, after the acetyl group's removed, it will then recruit this histone methyltransferase. And with the help of an adapter protein, that histone methyltransferase will add methyl groups to the tails, so they're effectively replacing those acetyl groups with methyl groups, and that will help to keep the nucleosome in place and further prevent expression of any genes that are wound up in this DNA in the nucleosome. So DNA methyltransferase is an enzyme that is used to add methyl groups to DNA. They always add methyl groups to Cs in the CG pairing into cytosines. Um, and there are really two different types of, or two classes of DNA methyltransferases. The first is we call a de novo methyltransferase. And this means that this methyltransferase adds a methyl group to a cytosine without prior knowledge. So it says uh, it might be instructed further up, uh, up the molecular pathway, but it just looks for the CG and it will add a methyl group. Now, perpetuating methyltransferase, um, this type of uh, methyltransferase will only add methyl groups if the opposite strand of DNA already has a methyl group. So it looks to match that methyl group on the new strand compared to the old strand. So this is really important because in when a gene is the genome is duplicated, so during genome replication, the DNA is replicated, but the methyl groups that were on the original strand, they're still there, but they're not matched because the replication machinery, uh, DNA polymerase, doesn't add methyl groups. So this perpetuating methyltransferase, DMT1, will come in later and it will look for all the pre-existing methyl groups on the parent strand and will add that on the daughter strand. So that way they are matching. And so otherwise, during every round of DNA replication, you would lose all your methylation information. And this is a way of preser preserving this methyl uh, epigenetic modification through subsequent cell divisions. A very interesting aspect of epigenetic inheritance is this idea of uh, parental imprinting or genomic imprinting. And this is when a gene you inherit from either your mother or your father is turned on or turned off based on whether or not you got your mom's, uh, you're using your mom's copy of the allele or your father's copy of the allele. So in this example here, we have this IGF2 and H19 uh, gene here. And uh, depending on who you inherit the gene from, the one of the two different genes are transcribed. So in this example, if you inherit uh, the, this copy from your mom on this chromosome, your mom's chromosome, uh, we have this CTCF insulating protein, and it will bind to this DMR site, and it will prevent the transcription of IGF2. Now, conversely, when you inherit a chromosome from your father, that gene or that uh, um, operator, the site where a uh, insulator or repressor will bind, is methylated. And because of that, it does not allow CTCF to bind. And thus, it causes uh, the transcription of IGF2. And since this methyl group is here, it will not allow transcription of H19. So depending on if you inherited a chromosome from your father or from your mother, we can also get unique expression based on this, and this is called genomic imprinting. So as I talked about earlier, uh, alternative splicing is a way that we can take one gene and we can make multiple different protein products. So kind of an aside story, back when the uh, human Genome Project was going on and the first human genome uh, was being constructed, they, there was a bunch of genomicists that got together and kind of had a bet as to how many genes would be in the human genome. And a lot of the scientists were betting, 
you know, 100,000, 200,000 genes because they knew how many proteins roughly were in the body. And so they thought there's got to be a similar number of genes to the number of proteins. And so these numbers got very, very high and very enlarged. And when it was all said and done, it turns out that there's about uh, 26, 28,000, uh, the number uh, updates uh, and expands and contracts depending on uh, annotations of the genome, but there's roughly, you know, mid 20,000 genes in the human genome, and yet there's a hundred some thousand proteins plus. And so the reason for this is this alternative splicing. And so, uh, as you can see here, we have a gene in the genome, and it has five different introns that are uh, five exons, uh, separated by introns, um, and these are numbered one, two, three, four, and five here. And so we can make multiple different protein products based on which exons we put together and how we alternatively splice it. So in this first example, we have a protein product that uses only the exons one, three, and five. And conversely, we have another protein product that uses one, two, four, and five. And so here we see that one gene can lead to multiple different protein products. And this is important for uh, tissues that are similar, but not exactly the same, right? So you can kind of uh, reutilize these genes dif in different ways to make similar products that can't be exactly the same, but need to be similar. So an example would be the different types of muscle, muscle tissue. So striated muscle tissue versus cardiac muscle tissue. You might use some sort of uh, protein product that is similar because they're similar tissues, but they're not exactly the same. And alternative splicing allows this uh, flexibility. So here we have a couple different examples that do take place in development of alternative splicing and the different protein products that arise from that. And so first we have uh, two different types of collagen. So procollagen, uh, which is a precursor to chondrocyte cells, uses uh, these three axons from this collagen gene, one, two, and three, but then the mature chondrocytes that contain the collagen are only using the first and second of those three uh, axons. And so depending on the maturity of these cells, uh, different protein products are, are taken, are, are created from this alternative splicing mechanism. Uh, similarly, these uh, fibroblast growth factors um, these are receptors within the cell, and depending on if the receptor is found in the ectoderm or in the mesoderm, we use different exons and splice them differently. Uh, so we have, uh, we sh we're just showing exons 7, 8, 9, and 10 here, and in the ectoderm, they use 7, 8, and 10 uh, of those exons, and then in the mesoderm, they use 7, 9, and 10. So as you can see, this allows a lot of modularity and the creation of a lot of different protein products uh, based on a single gene. So a very extreme example of this is uh, this gene called DSCAM, which is in Drosophila and has an anal uh, a homologous sequence in humans. Um, but this can produce, this one gene can produce up to 38,016 different types of proteins through RNA uh, or alternative splicing. And so there are these kind of cassettes within here uh, that contain a different amount of exons. And so um, exons uh, exon four has 12 alternative splice sites. So one of those 12 will be incorporated into a mature RNA. Uh, exon 6 has 48 alternatives. So one of the 48 will be used. Uh, exon 9 has 33 alternatives. So one of those 33 will be employed. And then exon 17 has two alternatives. So as you can see, depending on what different combinations of exons 4, 6, 9, and 17 that you incorporate into the mRNA, you get a different protein product. So this allows for like I said, 38,016 different possible combinations of different protein pro uh, products arising from a single gene. And so, like I said, this uh, gene has, uh, is homologous to a DNA sequence on uh, human chromosome number 21, um, and it's an expre uh, expressed within the nervous system of humans. And um, there's thought that this gene um, plays a role that contributes to uh, neurological defects when it is, uh, is disturbed or interrupted. So sometimes alternative splicing can be interrupted and this can lead to changes in the phenotype of an organism. 
And so in this case here, we have the example of hypertrophy, which is um, excess mus muscle growth within an organism. So in the wild type, we have uh, three exons, exon one, two, and three, and it is processed into a mature uh, messenger RNA and then into a protein that contains all three of those exons, and thus a fully functional um, protein. And this protein is responsible for telling muscle cells to stop dividing once they get to a certain point. So your muscle cells eventually, you know, reach a limit where they stop dividing and they say good enough, right? And so in the mutant, uh, we have a mutation from a G to an A, as you can see between these two sequences here. This G to an A causes improper splicing. And so instead of splicing out this whole intron, part of that intron gets incorporated into uh, this mRNA when it shouldn't be there. The introns should always be removed, right? And so because of that, within this intron, as you can see here, we have a termination codon. And so this termination codon is that stop codon that tells the ribosome when to stop incorporating amino acids. And so instead of being at the very end over here where it should terminate, because of this improper slicing, we're stopping prematurely. And what that leads to is this truncated protein that is missing its last two exons and instead has this little chunk of intron stuck to the end. And because of that, this protein isn't functional. It's missing two thirds of the required amino acids to become a functional protein. And since this protein's role in uh, metabolism is to tell these muscle cells to stop dividing, those muscle cells never get that message. And as you can see here, we end up with this swole mouse that is uh, got very much bigger muscles compared to the wild type mouse over here on the left. And so sometimes improper slicing can lead to problems. Um, in this case, if you're someone like me, you might be a little jealous and be like, oh, I wish I could have muscles like that mouse. But, uh, but it can lead to other disastrous effects too in mice uh, or human organisms where something that was um, supposed to be a protein in place is not there because of improper slicing. So another thing to consider throughout development is the aspect of time on development. And so sometimes um, the amount of time that a mRNA or protein is present plays a role in development. So if a protein, for instance, is only supposed to be within these cells for a certain amount of time, and then it degrades, and then development continues in a different direction, and if it's there longer or shorter than that period of time, we may have disruptions in development. So here uh, we have an example of casein, which is a protein um, that is um, in egg whites and things of that, uh, uh, for that matter. Um, and as we can see, if we have casein exposed to prolactin, prolactin is a hormone, um, it is uh, from its name, you can kind of see uh, that it has something to do with lactation. So prolactin is, um, is seen in pregnant women who are producing breast milk and things of that nature, but it has other roles within the cell as well. But it's a hormone, and if you are to have casein with prolactin, um, you see that we have this kind of curve that over time, casein slowly degrades, um, but is present for um, up to 48 hours, uh, and it continues to degrade. But if you were to remove prolactin, we can see that this casein protein, it degrades really fast, right? It's within the first six hours, it's pretty much gone. And so if you are developing as an organism and there is a developmental process that starts at 30 hours and it requires that casein be present, if you don't have prolactin, you're in trouble because your development's going to be significantly affected because you're missing that protein that's required for proper development. And so if things are there earlier or later or not as long as they're supposed to be, that can affect development as well. Lastly, we're gonna talk a bit about <clears throat> how these gradients are formed in this example in the Drosophila egg. Um, we have gradients of mRNA and proteins that are formed across uh, dictating the anterior and posterior axis of this egg. And so here we have uh, the localizations of these, uh, this nanos mRNA. 
Um, and mannose is obviously transcribed uh, within the nucleus and then it, it diffuses out into the cytoplasm. And as it diffuses, it gets captured at the very end, at the posterior end of the egg by an anchor protein known as Oscar. And at this point, um, when it is anchored to Oscar at the posterior end, then the transcription or the um, translation machinery can come in the ribosomes and it can turn that uh, mRNA that is captured into a protein. And as you can see, the concentration would be the highest over on this side of that protein because of the nanos protein, because that's the only place it gets translated. And then it will diffuse across uh, this egg to the anterior axis. So that's how we get one aspect of a gradient from the posterior to the anterior side. Now, another way we can form a gradient uh, is very similar where we have these, uh, this heat shock protein, HSP83, uh, that is transcribed in the nucleus and it will diffuse across the cell again. And similar, there is a protector protein complex, this green, that captures it <clears throat> and it allows transcription uh, or translation of the protein. But this uh, form of a gradient is much steeper. And the reason that is, is because unlike the last example with nanos, where we have this uh, very natural uh, uh, diffusion gradient across the cell, instead we have these little uh, deadenylase uh, complexes within the cytoplasm here. <clears throat> and what they do, <clears throat> excuse me, is they capture and will degrade these mRNA of heat shock protein that are not bound to that protector protein complex. And so if we were to think of this as a gradient, then after the protein is uh, created, there would be a lot less of them and the gradient is much steeper because these deadenylases are capturing and not allowing for as much of that protein be, to be created. And so the diffusion as, isn't as stark, where the highest amount of protein are gonna be the ones real close to those protector protein complexes. The last way that we're gonna talk about how mRNAs are uh, distributed across the cell is through active transport on the cytoskeleton. And so this causes accumulation of these mRNAs at a particular site. In this case, uh, we have these motor proteins, um, dynein and uh, kinesin, which will bind to uh, bicoid or to Oscar, and they will physically relocate them to one end or another of the uh, developing egg. And so in this case, we have uh, Oscar, which is uh, accumulating at the posterior end of the egg here because it's transported on this microtubule network. And we have bicoid, uh, which is the red uh, mRNA represented here, which is transported to the anterior excess. And so remember we have uh, different proteins or different uh, uh, proteins that caught or that have these different gradients with bicoid um, and Oscar and caudal and things of that nature. And so some of the ways that these are transported are through this microtubule network. Um, and that's how you get the larger gradients on one side or another. So that wraps up uh, this chapter. Um, as I have mentioned uh, in class, this is pretty dense, heavy genetic stuff. Um, so if within my YouTube channel, there's a lot of genetics um, lectures because I also teach genetics. Um, so if you are interested in uh, getting a little more background information or um, you know, supplementing this with some of those genetic lectures, I would highly recommend you look at the transcription and translation um, lectures as well as the lecture on uh, epigenetics.